This is my new old grill press I got from my grandpa, who sadly passed away last year. But at least I could rewipe his tool with awesome upgrades. The best variable speed with a pretty sweet RPM meter. And equally as awesome, I think, the base cabinet with the machine sunken below the surface, freeing up valuable workbench space. There's a lot more I want to show you about the restoration of this awesome machine. Here we go. It's a bit older, as you can tell from this, and runs on three-phase power, which I have in the workshop, but there's still a slight issue. So it has a forward and backward switch and a bunch of different speeds that you set with the belt and pulley system. But I'm so done changing speeds this way from my current drill press. Observe. Opening the lid that's bolted shut. Loosen the three nuts that hold the motor. Loosen the tension with this ingenious thumb screw and an Allen key a quarter turn at a time. Change the belts to one of the 16 available speeds, from which like four are actually useful. I totally need pulley settings to get 420, 430 and 470 RPM. What the f- Tension the belts again with the ingenious thumb screw. Retighten the bolts from the motor. Lose the lid and bolt it shut so the micro switch triggers. In conclusion, so I want a VFD for variable speed and never have to change belts again. But first thing first, let's take it apart for cleaning and maybe repair stuff. Homemade tea nut. The speed adjustment on this works the same. There are only 12 available speeds, but they make more sense. And the tensioning system would be easier to use. It doesn't work at the moment because it's seized or something. This is probably heavy, but it's not too bad. Just 13 kilos. Old electronic boxes are always interesting. We have two magnetic switches, one for forward, one for reverse. That's easy for uh, three-phase motors, just switch two of the phases done. And some connections at the switches are just bare copper wire. The start buttons close a contact and the stop button opens a contact. This pulley should pivot freely. It's not quite <laughs> doing that. I can reach the other end from below and should be able to punch it out with the shaft. Now I need to remove this nut. First removing the chuck. Now this can block the rotation. Well, that wasn't actually that tight. But this requires the gear puller. Oh, it was a cone. Now it looks kind of naked. Look at how massive this depth stop ring is. And it also doesn't just press with the knob onto this piece, because there's a groove all around the handle shaft and this special shaped piece, which fits there and there the knob presses on. This is good stuff. Wow, this is surprisingly a loose fit. Wow, this column is quite thick and it's also a cast part. Quite a layer of gunk on there. In case you didn't know how the hand crank works, there's a worm driving a gear. All right, now with everything in pieces, it's time for cleaning. I don't really know how to do that, so I'll just do it. Don't forget to brush your teeth, folks. And I mean all of them. Really, all of them. And this looks just like an ad for a cleaning product. It took about a day to clean everything. Super boring to watch, so we'll skip all over that. However, I was quite excited about the little vise. Stick to the end to see a pretty cool assembly of it. But for now, let's do something more interesting. Here we have the quill and the drive shaft. 
they slide through each other when you're plunging. Before the assembly, I want to replace the bearings because I can feel some resistance and a lot of resistance here. Here it's not as straightforward because there's this folded over metal lip. It acts kind of as a lock nut. And I guess tapping it open with a screwdriver is the best solution. The way this works, this also interacts with the spline shaft and when you fold one of them into the nut, the nut can't unscrew anymore. Thanks to bearings being standardized parts, getting replacements is super simple. I don't have a bearing press, so to install the bearings on the shafts, I just use a socket that's the size of the inner race, so I only hit it there. This didn't work all the way, but the hole in my current drill press table has just the right size to fully support the inner race, so I can hammer it in like this. Now this is fully seated. Then spacer and second bearing. For the front spindle bearing, I could also use the drill press table and the drill press column for a long through hole. To install this here, I can use the same setup, but now I should only hit the bearing on the outer race. So I disassembled one of the old bearings, can use this outer race and a chunk of steel to do that. Surprisingly, the recoil from this drove the shaft a little bit out again. So I'm driving that back in with the gear puller and that's okay because this is the same kind of load the bearing will experience during use in the drill press. Now installing the back bearing will be more of a pain because it gets pushed onto the shaft and into the housing at the same time. So I have to hit the inner and outer bearing race at the same time and have to support the end of the shaft and housing at the same time. So the lower bearing doesn't get any of the impact from hammering. To do that, I made this plate, which supports the inner and outer race of the bearing. For the front, I turned this piece that perfectly fits and touches both of these surfaces. And it's done without damaging the bearings. There were also some bumps along the groove, which I removed with a little grinding stone. I also replaced the bearings of this idler secondary pulley, but there's another problem because when I started disassembling it, it was moving pretty tightly. And I thought that was because of dirt in the hole, but now that it's clean, it's still, it's only this far in and it's pretty hard to move. It should move freely. I could chuck it the way it was ground initially and my dad then made it a perfect fit. That's better. And now it's time for the satisfying assembly, where I also spread fresh grease and oil on all necessary moving parts. Ah, I love this kind of stuff. It's kind of a mix of like Lego and a puzzle and the result is an incredibly useful tool. It first seemed that the quill is moving quite stiff, but once the oil spread enough, it moved nice and freely. Here I'm testing if the spring can reliably retract the quill from any height. On the side here should be this set screw riding in the slot of the quill and preventing it from twisting. My grandpa seemed to have remade this part from steel, which isn't ideal, so I make another replacement from brass. Ah, this feels nice and smooth with the new bearings. I also got new belts, cause the old ones were quite worn out. The mechanics are complete, now I can take care of the electrical stuff. Here I have the new frequency drive and I wire up the motor and the cable for testing. The supply goes in here, the motor wires go here and ground goes here. And it's on. Now I've entered the motor data and can try it out. 
and it works. Here I have the crude setup to test the functions I want with everything wired up as explained in the manual. This now starts the motor. And also a light comes on, but you probably can't see that at the moment. This switches the direction. Useful for cutting threads. Here's the speed adjustment knob. And stopping it. I mounted everything to a board on the side with now also a shielded motor cable, a main switch. The display is in a housing on the side so I can still operate the inverter and all the buttons are on the front. And as you can see, there's still a big hole because I thought how stupid but also cool would it be to have an analog RPM meter. So I got one. It works by getting pulses, for example, from a proximity sensor and a magnet passing by. I installed a sensor right here and the magnet sits on the bottom of the front pulley. However, with one pulse per revolution, this doesn't really work that well below a thousand RPMs and the needle starts bouncing around. Maybe that's because this is intended for like car engines and similar, which always run at about 800 and above. Doesn't really matter, I only need more pulses per revolution. So on the pulley, I 3D printed a ring that evenly spaces 30 magnets now and gives me 30 pulses per revolution. And after setting the RPM meter to also 30 pulses per revolution, it works and shows me the low RPM really well. And now with power. I like this. Now it's cleaned, repaired, working again with the new features. Next, I show you how I built this pretty sweet base cabinet for it, where the machine foot is sunken down, so I have a continuous table surface, which is convenient and looks pretty cool. I've already made two separate videos about the construction of the space. I didn't change anything, so here it is again in a 22 second build montage. Now here's the difference to the other cabinets I built. The front upper rail is split into three pieces with the middle one mounted a bit lower where the drill press base sits on. The rest is the same as my other cabinets again. The individual frames get screwed together with big washer head screws and there are two additional stretchers that hold the board for the drill press. Now it's done and I can take apart the old cabinet. There are a bunch of drawers that I will reuse and I also took that opportunity to clear stuff out I haven't used in years. I honestly expected worse. Unfortunately the camera battery died during the assembly so you just have to imagine how I screwed these sections back together. But I then could reuse the drawer runners as well and now the last part missing is the top. The drill press sits on this platform, so the top needs a cutout in this shape. I removed the bulk with the jigsaw, screwed templates to the back and finished the shape with a flush trim bit. I am so satisfied with this fit and the offcut is a perfect filler piece. Ah, nice. Cleaning will be easier now and everything is a bit lower at a more comfortable height for me. So now to do something with it, I want to install a spinning handle on this crank. And now immediately turning down the speed is so nice. Much better than a static handle. I then also replaced the main crank handles with similar shaped ones which I just liked better than the original. Off camera I also installed an emergency stop and a micro switch so when you open this it stops and you can't turn it on until it's closed again. Also interesting after 40 years of use checking the accuracy of the quill. Fully extended there's about 6 100th millimeter play front to back. 3 100 side to side and 4 100 run out with the chuck. 
Without the chuck in the cone, it's about 2100. That's pretty good. Let's compare this to my old drill press. 12 100 front to back, 10 100 side to side, 4 100 run out in the cone, and 6 100 with the chuck. It's better in everything and multiple times older. Just a quality tool, really cool. I'm not done with the upgrades, as you can tell from these two switches with no function yet. I have more pretty cool ideas in mind for a future video, so subscribe to not miss that. You can also support me directly with making these videos. Check out the video description for that. And now, as promised, the little vice.